All right, I'm up next. So thanks for hanging in, guys. Uh, one more until we get a break. Um, yeah, it's good to be here. So the alternative title uh, for this, I realized, which maybe would have been catchier, uh, would have been uh, Chaos Theory, Twitter Features, and Human Connection. Um, yeah, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But first, a little bit about me. Uh, so this uh, screenshot tells you a lot about who I am. Um, so this is a screenshot from Elder Scrolls Online. Um, and uh, if, if you weren't to find me in Pennsylvania, uh, where I live with um, my wife and two kids, uh, I work full time right now for InterVarsity Christian Fellowship as the director, founding director for Ministry and Digital Spaces. Um, I'm also a PhD student uh, through Michigan State. Um, and if I wasn't doing those things, you might find me in the world of Tamriel, uh, which is the setting for Elder Scrolls Online. Uh, there's a little bit more that you can, you can pull out of this screenshot. Uh, so... Uh, all, of my, all of my character names uh, in this game uh, are, are based on a T.S. Eliot poem, and, and one stanza from a T.S. Eliot poem that goes, and I'll count uh, as, as I go through so you can see how many screen names I have. Uh, so this stanza in, in the four quartets starts with, Old men ought to be explorers. Here and there does not matter. We must be still and still moving into another intensity for a further union, a deeper communion through the dark cold the empty desolation, the wave cry, the wind cry, the vast waters of the petrol and the porpoise, and my end is my beginning. Um, so I have five, five screen names from this one stanza. This is one of my favorite bits of poetry. Um, it's become my hope and my prayer for, for my son's life, um, that he will have a lifetime of exploration, um, and it's been deeply meaningful and challenging uh, to me. Um, so the last bit about me is that I'm actually wrapping up my time uh, in, in the coming days, uh, just a few weeks, um, with InterVarsity, and I'm transitioning to become a full-time PhD student um, at Michigan State uh, studying educational technology. Um, most broadly, um, I'm interested in how people connect with each other using the internet, um, kind of the, one of the great tools of our age. Um, and more specifically, I'm looking at how teachers connect with each other on social media um, for professional development, communities of practice, and that sort of thing. Um, and I'll get to some of that a little bit later in the talk. Um, so I feel a little bit bad. Uh, so Jurassic Park is going to get uh, a bit of a hit. Two talks in a row. I, I don't know if that's ever happened at Passion Talks before. So that's pretty cool. Um, so we'll get to Jurassic Park in a minute. Um, but uh, there's this idea of, of chaos theory. You know, there's the butterfly effect, this idea that something so small and innocuous as a butterfly um, can flap its wings, and, and that little uh, disturbance of the air can create profound effects later. Um, so this idea of, oh, you see this cute butterfly, um, but who knows what effects that's causing. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but like some of you, uh, a good bit of my understanding of chaos theory, particularly as a teenager, uh, was formed by the film Jurassic Park and this character Ian Malcolm uh, as, he, as he goes on and on and on about chaos theory throughout, throughout this film um, and, and the book. Uh, and so he demonstrates it by, by dropping drops of water on the back of someone's hand. And he says, okay, look, you, you, you think you're dropping the drops in the exact same place, uh, but it, the drops roll in different directions. And it's because there's actually slight variation in where those drops land. And that slight variation leads to you know, completely different directions of, of where those drops go. Um, <laughs> the more I've been thinking about this, uh, the more I've been thinking, I'm not sure that actually, uh, that, I think that demonstration was pretty good. Uh, I'm not sure um, his conclusions actually have very much to do uh, with, with chaos theory. Um, what I got out of it as a, as a teenager was, was basically chaos theory means chaotic endings and dinosaurs end up eating people. Um, so I thought this was a really cool theory as a teenager. I'm like, oh, cool, like chaos theory. Like basically they're going to be dinosaurs and they're going to eat everybody. Um, so I don't know. That sounded fun. Um, as an as a undergraduate, um, I, I did some math research and um, learned a little bit more about, about chaos theory. Uh, and <laughs> uh, my understanding of actually what, what chaos theory is, is is these slight differences in initial conditions that can lead to massive difference later. Um, so in this case, it's like you're playing billiards on, on a pool table um, and m increasingly complex pool tables. Uh, and so in this case, you have, um, you're starting in the exact center and you hit two shots, uh, the red line and the yellow line. Um, and so initially, they're just slightly different. They're just, the angle is ever so slightly different. Um, and you can see, after just a few um, uh, uh, ricochets, 
uh, the, the pool balls end up in very different places. The paths look very different. The longer this goes on, the more different those paths become, um, and the more complex your, your pool table is, uh, the, the more quickly these changes um, uh, manifest. So more complex system and more time means more and more and more difference. Um, the math research I was doing, uh, we, we were actually looking at a billiards table that was actually sort of like a four-dimensional pillow with the corners of it kind of stretched into infinity and there's this hyperbolic surface. Um, so even though chaos theory was no longer about dinosaurs eating people, it was still pretty cool because they were four-dimensional hyperbolic pillows. Um, that was pretty fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so just to recap, chaos theory is not... Um, it's not Murphy's Law, which I think Jurassic Park is actually a whatever bad thing can happen will happen. That's Jurassic Park. Um, the billiard table is slight differences end up being noticed later. Um, and we see this in, in systems that seem fairly straightforward and simple. So the game of tennis has been played for over 150 years, um, millions of matches likely. It's been played all over the world. Um, and you think, like, a tennis match goes in a certain way, and there's a little bit of variation in terms of how long it takes, but generally it, it follows. Um, until 2010, at Wilmington, uh, there was a match that took over three days to complete. Um, it took 11 hours, over 11 hours of actual gameplay, um, and the final game took over eight hours. Uh, the, the match, uh, the, the tie-breaking score, at, finally at the end, you can kind of see this up here, uh, was 70 to 68, 70 points to 68 points. Um, and and the, the reason I mention this, um, it, it's a form of emergent play. So Ian Bogos is a scholar uh, who, who studies games, um, and he talks about emergent play. So that's one conclusion you can, you can get to from this tennis match. The other interesting thing is, um, in terms of a chaotic ending, um, it was just some initial decisions that the creators of tennis made, that you have, to win a, you have to win a final set by at least two points. That's a simple thing. You decide up front 150 years ago, and generally you don't really feel the effects of that until one day or three days. Suddenly it takes forever <laughs> to finally get two points ahead uh, and, and finish out the match. Um, so this is an example. You know, the creators of tennis never imagined that this simple rule that they put into place would result in such a crazy, long, drawn-out match. So the, the site of my particular research uh, is Twitter, uh, and, and so we'll, we'll tie it back into chaos theory in a minute. Um, but just to say, uh, you might think, uh, and as I've talked to people, particularly here in Silicon Valley, about Twitter, I usually get a little bit of a side, um, side eye, like, Really, Twitter, <laughs> uh, of, of, all the, of all the social media platforms you could study these days. Um, and, and there are a few reasons for that. So one, Twitter still hasn't figured out how to make a profit um, as of last quarter. Uh, they haven't figured out how to stem endemic abuse, um, which is problematic. Um, and it's the favored platform for politicians, not just in the US, but all over the world. And these three factors mean that it's, um, it's an unusual choice of platform uh, for somebody who says, uh, you know, my, my life's purpose is to help the internet become a more generous place. Um, and I want to study human connection. And yet there are these three factors for Twitter that are like, that's an interesting choice. Um, so I want to start with some of the design choices, early design choices for Twitter. And then we'll look at what are some of the effects that, that it's had and, and how are they surprising. So um, Twitter founder and... Uh, Early CEO and now returned CEO Jack Dorsey described Twitter as a platform early on as it's just it's a tool to share short bursts of inconsequential information, <laughs> which is literally the the meaning of the word Twitter. Like it's just oh it's just short inconsequential information. Like you know that's it. We're just, it, it spawned a genre uh, called microblogging. Um, there's a they they intentionally designed a 140 character limit to match you know the limit for original SMS text messages. Um, there's some question of is Twitter even a social network? It, it wasn't originally really intended to be a social network. It was just a place to dump very very short <laughs> inconsequential thoughts. Um, so brief. That was the first design decision. Uh, the second, um, which starting to get more interesting, um, is that the default for Twitter is that anything you share is public. You can make your tweets private. You can do what's called protecting them, but that's a choice you have to make. The default is public, which is interesting, you know, as you compare to other social networking platforms, other um, internet sharing sites. Uh, Twitter is designed to be asymmetrical. 
So that means you follow me, I don't have to follow you back and vice versa. Um, whereas other platforms are, are based on mutuality, Twitter says it's fine. You, know, you can be, you can, um, you can be as asymmetrical, uh, it's unilateral. Um, yeah, connections, and that creates some interesting possibilities. Uh, and finally, information is presented to you in a stream. So everything just keeps flowing down, and because lots of people are, are tweeting, anybody you're following, it just, it just cranks down, and it's a constant flow of information. Um, which, again, seems, okay, that's great. They, they just decided to do that. Um, there have been some researchers who've pointed to, this has actually marked, this has helped mark the shift from social networking to social media. So the, the, the idea of a stream actually highlights the importance of, of media and images and, and, and that kind of content, um, which again, just interesting consequences. I would argue one of the most interesting things Twitter has done is actually allowed users um, and how users are, are using um, Twitter in practice to influence the actual design. So, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, so mods are, are just adaptations, uh, and, and particularly things that users start to do um, to, to make the platform a little bit different. Um, so these three things, uh, hashtag, ret retweets, and uh, replies, um, I, I think are now synonymous with what Twitter is and how we understand the platform. Um, none of these were originally features. Of, of Twitter, these are things that people just started doing. People started sticking pound signs at the beginning of text, and you know, and that was a way of indexing conversation. Later, it became a way of creating an actual space where communities could form and conversations could live. Um, people started putting uh, RT in front of a response to somebody, um, or, or uh, in front of quoting somebody else's tweet, and that was a way of sharing somebody else's information, broadcasting more broadly, um, creating a new social outcome. Uh, for, for tweets. Um, and then the at reply was just a, a way of marking a conversation thread. So you could try and talk to somebody, but this was, this was a user-generated way of saying, like, let's actually try and thread some things. It's still not super easy to follow Twitter conversations, um, but it's better than, <laughs> than was originally designed. Um, and so the question I, I've uh, been, been wrestling with is, what are the results of these initial design decisions and then some of these mods? What are, these all seem like fairly small uh, decisions, um, but what are the outcomes? So first, I uh, wanted to quickly go through issues. Um, lots of other people have researched and studied um, you know, the problems with Twitter, named a few up front, named three up front. Um, a few others that I think are less obvious but are important and other people are studying. Um, our Twitter has helped <laughs> uh, reshape our understanding of what it means to be public. Um, there, there are people doing research on the expansion of networked publics. Um, now, there was a joke going around Twitter uh, a, a little while back that, that helps exemplify this. Um, and, and the joke goes, so basically Solomon predicts Twitter about 3,000 years ago. In Ecclesiastes, in Ecclesiastes 1020, uh, he wrote, Do not curse the king, even in your thoughts, or curse the rich, even in your bedroom. For a bird of the air may carry your voice, or some winged creature will tell of it. So, be careful what you say. You never know who's listening. <laughs> so, great social media uh, warning, and particularly, you know, the imagery for, for Twitter. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it, you know, jokes aside, it does pre present this problem of what is public? What does it mean for something to be public? And then the follow-up, what should be public? <laughs> and maybe what shouldn't be public? Um, and, it, and it raises all kinds of, of tensions between intimacy and shame, humility and ego, uh, security and vulnerability. These are new questions. Um, these are the conversations I, I think we should be having, um, but often get distracted by. Um, we get distracted by all kinds of other things, uh, you know, yeah, other problems with, with the internet and social media, fake news, tribalism, uh, things like that. Um, Twitter's also introduced just noise. Uh, it's noisy, there's tons of new information. Um, there are issues of attention. Where does our attention go? Where are we present? Where should we be present? I, I think it's not always the default that we should be present on, offline. I think there are times when we should be present to the people um, that we're in mediated communication with. Um, but this issue of noise, how do we deal with that? Um, anti-social anti behavior, um, 
it's just, it's really easy to misbehave these days. Um, and, and I could list a whole bunch of these. It's really easy to unintentionally troll your colleagues um, to create grief, uh, gaslighting, doxing, actual threats of physical harm. Um, it's just, it's easy to do these things. Um, and, and finally, filtered, um, it's easy to find yourself in an information bubble. So I do want to spend uh, a couple minutes on unexpected benefits, though. So again, things that maybe Twitter didn't imagine would ever come, come from it. Um, and so this, the tweet up here, um, it's basically people talking about the pain of, of being a math teacher and realizing, who do I talk to? If I'm the only geometry teacher, the only algebra teacher in my physical building, I have a problem, who do I talk to? Um, and this, uh, in this hashtag, MTBOS stands for the Math Twitter Blogosphere. And it's a group of math teachers who are, who are in support of each other, who've actually found a community of practice together. Um, and this tweet reads, um, if it weren't for this hashtag, this hashtag space, I don't think I'd still be teaching. This is, this is my place where I, where I come to get support. There's no one in my building I can find, um, but this is the place that keeps me going. Um, and I would say, actually, Twitter has intentionally created a very simple set of, uh, of, of options. Of the, the user interface is very straightforward. Um, and I think because of that, it can actually encourage people that would normally just watch to actually jump in and participate. Because there aren't that many things you can do with it. So yeah, you can hit the like button. You can retweet somebody. Um, there's some, some on-ramps uh, to engagement. And because of all this, um, despite Twitter not being able to find a profit, despite the abuse, despite all the problems, Twitter has become this can't-miss tool for a number of communities. So for educators, um, for teachers, I think more and more um, this is becoming the case. For grad students in academia, for activists and social movements, um, it's like you can't really avoid Twitter. Even though most people don't use it, um, there are people that you can't go without. And so what does all this mean for us, for people? Um, we're going to wrap up in just a moment. Um, yeah, so <laughs> first I would say, I think one of, one of the staff on my, on my university team um, just said, like, I think most people are just doing social media wrong. Um, and, and by that, um, he was trying to point out, uh, most people think of social media and they want to broadcast their own ideas. Um, they want to market something or sell something. They want to just lurk and watch and not get involved. Um, and that's not what we mean. You can easily use Twitter or any social medium um, to do that. Um, but I think to do it right, it means you actually want to gather. You want to find your people. Um, you can join an existing community practice. If you're a math teacher, I highly recommend uh, just hashtag MTBOS if you're Another kind of teacher, if you're into other things, we can find a hashtag. But there's probably a community of practice for you to join. You can create your own professional learning network. Um, you can just find other affinity spaces to find like-minded people. And you can choose to learn from people that are different from yourself. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about Twitter. Um, yeah, so this is a, a brief model of some of the research I'm doing for my PhD. I'm just thinking, what is the experience of interacting, of getting feedback? Um, through Twitter, uh, yeah. So it's something I'm calling Twitter circuits. It's like an electrical circuit. Um, you have a power source. You have something that's consuming it, and then the the, the loop back. Um, so creators who are tweeting, people that are reading it, and then ways of of engaging back. And I want to understand what's the experience of that. So uh, I'm going to wrap up. But again, where we've come from. So this idea of chaos theory. There. Absolutely massive consequences of tiny decisions you make at the beginning, even in designing a tool or product like Twitter. Um, Twitter itself is fairly simple. There aren't that many decisions that have gone into it, but each of them has consequences, and these have profound effects on how we connect with each other as people. We Mass Media. Media Empowering Community.